Good morning. Would you stand and greet one another in the name of Jesus Christ? Welcome, one and all. We are so glad that you're here worshiping with us, especially those of you who are here for maybe the first or second or third time, anyone's uh, feeling new. We hope you feel welcome. Okay, if you would please sign the friendship pad that is located in your pew and pass that down. That helps us know who is here. It's very helpful. A few announcements for you. Please read your bulletins if you would. The back two pages are filled with announcements that we think are important enough to print. So uh, do check those out. I'm going to point out a few things. First of all, the uh, youth group meets tonight. We're, we're launching youth group tonight at 6 o'clock. That's for 8th graders through 12th graders. And if you want to know why 8th graders, there's information in the bulletin about that. Uh, but we're excited about tonight. There is no dinner. I don't know why that's printed in the bulletin. It says there's dinner, but there's not. Uh, there's a lot of snacks, though, and drinks and things like that, but no dinner. <coughs> Wonderful Wednesday also begins this week, uh, this Wednesday night. Dinner and then some classes. Again, information in the bulletin about those. We hope that you will join us on Wednesday night. Maybe you're someone who has been coming to the church for a long time, but just never really did the Wednesday night thing. Give it a try. Uh, give Wednesday nights a try. It's, it's, a, it's a fun time. Please make reservations. That helps us know uh, how much to cook. Wonderful. Three, number three, Isaiah 117 House. That ministry partnership is fully launched and underway, and we're grateful for the, um, the contributions that we've been given. There's lots more to do. Uh, we will, you'll be hearing a lot about the Isaiah 117 House uh, in the weeks and months and, and probably years to come. And so uh, there's information about that in the lobby and then also on our church website, that ongoing partnership. And then finally... Next Sunday, 9.30 a.m., we're beginning a new Presbyterian 101 class. So anybody who's curious about what it means to be a Presbyterian, the history of the Presbyterian church, the history of this particular church, what makes us unique as a worshiping community, is welcome to come to this class. Maybe you've been a member here for a long time and you just forgot uh, these, some of these things. You are also welcome to come to that class. And Presbyterian 101 begins next Sunday at 9.30. Classroom C. Classroom C. Uh, anything else? Okay. Let's uh, prepare our hearts and minds now to worship God.
that day you will say, give praise to the Lord and proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let it be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. Let us worship the Lord. I'm not sure how your week went. My week was a little chaotic. Often in those moments of chaos and confusion, when we find ourselves in the muck and the mire, I'm always amazed how rarely do I turn to Jesus for his grace and mercy. Instead, I turn to my own good works, thinking that somehow, some way, I can pull myself out of this, failing every time. And so we come here on this Sabbath day, not just for rest, but to worship the great triune God, knowing that in Jesus Christ our sins have already been forgiven, His mercy has already been offered, His love is already there for us. Therefore, I invite you to confess what our God already knows, our faults, our failures, our mistakes, first as the body of Christ then in the silence of our own hearts. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, it is astounding how many ways we find to doubt you. At times we doubt your power 
and your ability to do actual miracles in our lives. In other situations, we doubt that your methods and solutions are the best way to go. We fool ourselves into believing that our ways will be superior to your ways. And most importantly, we doubt that all you are doing is the result of your great love for us. Our heads believe in your love, but our hearts are lagging behind. Have mercy upon us, Lord. Help us with our disbelief. Forgive us for looking through worldly eyes instead of asking you for a heavenly vision. Thank you for your endless grace and patience. More than anything, we want to walk in your will. We pray all this in the precious name of Jesus. My beloved, hear the good and great news of Jesus Christ. I tell you the truth. It is in his name our sins have been forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I'm Bob Hunt, and I am representing the Mission Committee. And what I'm here to do is call your attention to this little bulletin insert, which is about the fact that, once again, it is time for our auction for Stillwaters, Gifts, Crafts, and Talents, which will be held September 18th, which is a wonderful Wednesday evening, to which we hope you can come. And we also hope that you will contribute something to auction off. Now, for those of you who do not know, uh, what this auction is done for is to benefit the Stillwaters Ministry. The Stillwaters Ministry was started by our par former parish associate, Reverend Joyce Merritt. What it is an attempt to do is provide assistance for single parent families in which the parent is trying to, shall we say, move up get out of that minimum wage job, get into something that has a little bit more skill, that requires some education to do. But in order for that parent to do it, that person has to do it with kids in tow. Not an easy task. And that's why Stillwaters exists, is to provide assistance for these single parent families that are trying to move up. So that's what it's about. Our particular part of this as the auction is there, we are providing assistance with child care money. And if you've ever tried to purchase child care, you know what I mean. So that's what the auction's for. Uh, we are asking, as this insert says, for gifts, gift baskets particularly, crafts and talents. And I'll tell you, last year when I challenged you to come up with a good donation, I brought up the gift basket, and I told you at that time that I was going to create a Bucky's gift basket. And for those of you who came to the auction, you know that I did. I was as good as my word. Well, created a problem, though, because now it's this year. How do you top a Bucky's gift basket? Can't be done. So I'm sitting here racking my mind. What do I come up with? Well. I thought about the talents part of this. Last year, Rob McDaniel, Mr. Political Science, 
Rob McDaniel was offering a conversation about politics. Yes, he was. I bid on it. I won. Now think about this, folks. I paid good money to talk with Rob McDaniel. <laughs> Something about P.T. Barnum and there's a sucker born every minute, well, but I'm okay with that. Uh, the challenge right now is if you have something that you can contribute that will go on auction, please think about that and please contact us. Also, think about September 18th, a month or so from now, to come, eat dinner, and bid. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bob. And now I invite the Young Church to come forward and join me for a few minutes. Good morning. How's everyone? Good? Everybody good? Did we start we started back? No? You're, you started back a couple of weeks ago, right? No, this week. This week. And everybody else said, yeah, yeah, yeah. So how was it? Good, good. I'm glad y'all love school. Uh, that was not me when I was your age. So I, I'm glad to hear that. So uh, this morning, uh, we are continuing a series of sermons we've been doing on hymns. You know what a hymn is? So hymn is, hymn is what we do when we sing out of that blue book. We're singing hymns. And some of those hymns, you, you know, you may go, man, I guess this is good. But for your parents and your grandparents, those hymns mean a lot. And this day, Reverend Haring is going to do a hymn called Holy, Holy, Holy. Do you know what the word holy means? You know what that means? Holy. Holy moly, right. Moly is holy. What is, but what does it mean? What does holy mean? Have you ever thought about it? Holy, anybody? Holy means to set apart. Something is set apart. That's something so special that it's set apart from us. And often when we speak about something being holy, we speak about God being holy. And one of my favorite passages in the Bible is the story when Moses was watching his father-in-law's sheep in the desert, and he comes across this bush that is burning, only it's not burning down, it's just flames. And all of a sudden, Moses hears a voice. You know what that voice said? It said, Moses, take off your what? Your shoes. This is holy ground. What made the ground holy? God did. You know, Virgil, it's one or two answers. God or Jesus. Good job. <laughs> God made that ground holy because God's presence was there. So anytime we are in the presence of God, we are on what? Holy ground. And we are on holy ground this morning because why? God is present with us. I thought about having you take off your shoes, Virgil, but then I thought your parents might be upset about that. So uh, we're keeping our shoes on. How about that? So why don't we bow our heads and pray after me? Thank you, God, for being present in our lives. Thank you, God, for allowing us to stand on holy ground. We love you because you first loved us. Amen. All right, guys, thank you so much. There you go. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Right here. Now you got to take one I give you. That's the rules. There you go, there you go, of course, of course, of course.
Let us pray together. God, whom we know through the scriptures and creation, speak to us in this hour. Show us the wisdom and joy of your ways that we may know what is good and do what is right through Jesus Christ, your word. Amen. Psalm 130. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you, so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than those who watch for the morning, more than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. The word of the Lord. This morning we are continuing our series of sermons inspired by the most popular hymns across the church throughout North America. And number three on the list, Holy, 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 written by Reginald Heber. It was from these verses in Revelation 4 uh, that Heber based his Trinitarian lyrics. And so let's turn our attention to Revelation chapter 4. 
starting at verse 1. Now listen for God's word. Then as I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And the same voice I had heard before spoke to me like a trumpet blast. The voice said, come up here and I will show you what must happen after this. And instantly I was in the spirit and I saw a throne in heaven and someone sitting on it. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian. And the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. They were all clothed in white and had gold crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And in front of the throne were seven torches with burning flames. This is the sevenfold Spirit of God. Also in front of the throne was a shiny sea of glass, sparkling like crystal. In the center and around the throne were four living beings, each covered with eyes, front and back. The first of these living beings was like a lion. The second was like an ox. The third had a human face. And the fourth was like an eagle in flight. Each of these living beings had six wings, and their wings were covered with eyes, inside and out. Day after day, and night after night, they kept saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Whenever the living beings give glory and honor and thanks to the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down and worship the one sitting on the throne, the one who lives forever and ever. And they lay their crowns before the throne, and they say, You are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and they exist because you created what you pleased. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. God, we do give you thanks for your word. And we pray now that you would meet us in this place. Through your Holy Spirit, speak to us through it. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Reginald Heber, Reggie. Uh, Reginald Heber was a poet, but I think what he cared about more than anything else was worship. He was born in a small English village in 1783 and would eventually follow in his father's footsteps into ministry. And his love of poetry and his talent for writing it blossomed into the study of hymns. He dreamed of writing awesome hymns of a very high literary quality that would correspond with the church year. Songs that churches all over the world could use to enhance their worship throughout the year. And he really did have a gift for writing poetry. For 16 years, he served his local parish, and he wrote 57 hymns. In 1822, at the age of 40, he followed God's call to Calcutta, India. Four years later, in a small village there in India, he preached to a large crowd in weather, I was going to say like weather we've been having, but these last couple days have been glorious. So just go back to like a week ago. It was really hot, really humid. Afterwards, Reginald went for a swim to cool off, and while swimming, he suffered a stroke and drowned. After he died, his widowed wife found the 57 hymns that he'd written in a trunk. They were later published, and among them was this great Trinitarian hymn based on Revelation 4, Holy, Holy, Holy 
Lord God Almighty. I've talked about poetry before. Poetry doesn't give us information. Poetry gives us an experience. Revelation was written by St. John. St. John was part theologian, part pastor, but all poet. And in the spirit, John wrote down what he saw in the form of a poem. To read Revelation as an informational almanac about what's going to happen or when things are going to happen would be to miss the point, or rather to miss the experience that God has for us. The words of Revelation are meant to revive the imagination of the church. Well, why do we need to be revived? What is at stake here is that we as the church might become a little too familiar with the routines of being the church. We might thoughtlessly just go through the church motions. I would ask for a show of hands if anybody has ever just gone through the motions, but I won't. Because anyone who's been in the church for any length of time knows exactly what I'm talking about. In our familiarity with it all, we retrogress. I think that's a good word for it. What I mean is, instead of becoming more mindful, we actually become less mindful. Instead of becoming more open and more aware of God's glory and God's splendor all around us at any moment, we simply don't see it or notice it. So what will we do? The great pastor Eugene Peterson wrote my favorite book about Revelation called Reversed Thunder. And he points out that everything in the book of Revelation can be found in the previous 65 books of the Bible. Revelation does not add anything new of substance to what we already know from Scripture. Shocking, maybe, but true. The book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible, and it gives us the last word on God's kingdom and God's mission in the world. And I think it's appropriate that a poet has the last word in the Bible. And in Revelation 4, we get the last word on what was most important to Reginald Heber, worship. St. John's audience, the church in Laodicea, had just heard a very powerful and very short sermon. It was an invitation. Seven words. I'm sure you probably wish some of our sermons were seven words. But here it is. I stand at the door and knock. I stand at the door and knock. And our reading for this morning begins with these words. As I looked, I saw a door standing open in heaven. And what does St. John see? Well, through that door, he sees the church gathered for worship. And not just that, but he sees what happens when we worship together. When we worship we do so believing that we are in God's presence. As John said during time at the Young Church, a presence that makes this space holy. And what we do in worship, our reading, our praying, our listening, our singing, all of it is our feeble attempt to give God our attention, right? Meanwhile, our phones vibrate in our pockets. Sometimes they ring out loud. We think about what we're going to have for lunch. We daydream about whatever. Our minds wander. We worry about our weeks ahead. Here in worship, we feebly try to give some of our attention to the God who speaks and reveals, the God who creates and redeems, who orders and blesses. 
when it comes to our worship, can you think back to when you were the outsider? You ever wonder what our worship looks like to someone who might be new around here? The outsider sees a group of folks singing very strange songs. They see us read from an old book and go on and on about things that may or may not have anything to do or be of any personal interest. The outsider sees us eat tiny portions of bread and juice that we say give nourishment to our souls the way that pulled pork and potato salad nourish our bodies. And so which is it? Is worship an actual meeting called to order at God's initiative in which people of faith are blessed by God's presence and respond to God's salvation? Or is it just a pathetic, desperate charade in which we attempt to get God to pay attention to us and maybe do something for us? Jesus stands at the door and knocks. And this morning, we're, giving, we're given an answer to what happens when we open that door. What does worship do? Worship centers, gathers, reveals, sings, and affirms. I saw a throne and someone sitting on it. A throne centers authority. Worship is centering. In worship, God gathers us to himself, who is at the center. And gathered at the center, our lives become centered in the living God. It is our worship, then, that enables us to live in response to and from this center. Without worship, we are rudderless, vulnerable to manipulation and to manipulate. As Peterson puts it, without worship, we move in either frightened panic or deluded lethargy as we are, in turn, alarmed by specters and soothed by placebos. People who don't worship live in a vast shopping mall, visiting different shops and expending their energy to meet this need or to satisfy that appetite. Life lurches from one partial satisfaction to another, interrupted by ditches of disappointment. Life and choices are fueled by illusions that buying these clothes or driving that car or eating that meal or drinking that beverage will center our lives and give them coherence. But it's over all these places of false worship that the prophet Jeremiah declares a glorious throne set on high from the beginning. This is the throne that St. John sees in his vision. And the effect of that centering throne is a vast gathering. Twenty-four thrones surrounded him, and twenty-four elders sat on them. Worship gathers. These 24 elders represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the 12 disciples. 12 plus 12 is 24. The old Israel and the new church. And there's also these four living creatures covered in eyeballs, which is fascinating, and we're not going to get into eyeballs today. Uh, but they're also gathered there, each one an aspect of creation, just as the 24 are all facets of the faith. The lion, the noblest, the ox, the strongest, Human, wisest, and the swiftest eagle. Life is usually messy. It's chaotic. It is endlessly baffling. Life. Worship gathers all of it into its rituals and its rhythms. 
in worship, the spiritual world and the natural world are not divided. They're brought into this divinely choreographed dance. Every aspect of God's creation centered on a throne that radiates a beautiful and revealing light, bathing all things in every color of the spectrum. I've wondered if this is stained glass. This is a side note, by the way. I have nothing printed here. Uh, I wonder if this is why stained glass found its way to churches. Filtering light, coloring light, actually illuminating a place in a special way. Here, Reginald Heber's words I also begin to find their footing. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, early in the morning our song shall rise to Thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. The one sitting on the throne was as brilliant as gemstones, like jasper and carnelian, and the glow of an emerald circled his throne like a rainbow. Worship reveals. Illuminated by this light is not only all persons and creatures, but a shiny sea of glass like crystal. And this is a sea that somehow we must get through. It is the baptismal sea that marks our entrance into the worshiping community. These are the waters that we pass through, leaving death and the old behind and emerging cleansed and alive. Centered and gathered by the grace of the triune God, emerging from this baptismal sea of glass, our minds are cleared, our perceptions come into focus, and our spirits are renewed. And as all of this happens, our ordinary, clumsy, anxious speech is transformed into poetry and raised into song. Holy, 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 all the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around that glassy sea, cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who wert and art and evermore shalt be. Day and night, day and night, they kept saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, the one who always was, who is, and who is still to come. Worship sings. The Bible's full of songs. We know this. Moses, Miriam, David, Deborah, Mary, angels, Jesus, the disciples, they all sing. When we become aware of who God is, and what God is doing, we sing too. Our old blue hymnals there in front of you are not just song books, they are prayer books. Worship is meant to touch us deeply and to stir our hearts to adoration. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, all of creation is invited to join in a response which becomes a melody of thanksgiving. This is what songs do. This is what hymns do. Gather our voices into a choir that spans the ages and travels through unseen dimensions. Holy, 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 though the darkness hide thee, though the eye of sinfulness thy glory may not see, only thou art holy. There is none beside thee, perfect in power, in love and purity. St. John's vision continues into chapter 5. We didn't read that far, but here's what it says. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. Worship affirms. The last word in our worship here is always the same. Amen. Or amen. We've covered that these mean the same thing. <laughs> amen. This is no accident that this is our final word in worship. Amen means yes. 
in our worship together, we hear the very good news that God says yes to us. And we respond to God's yes by saying yes. Amen. I often say as we prepare to confess, each one of us enters the sanctuary dragging the unseen burden of our sin. Every Sunday, we enter this place with experiences of rejection and of being rejected. We drag in all of our naysaying and all of our no thank yous. But when we worship, our hearts, our minds, our very lives are turned around. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, all thy works shall praise thy name in earth and sky and sea. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. My friends, the gospel is complete and revealed in the person of Jesus Christ. There is nothing new to say about it. But there are new ways to say it. And so what we get from Revelation is not new information, but a new imagination, one that revives. Worship centers, gathers, reveals, sings, and affirms. One theologian wrote that the risen Christ is a great big yes to everything. At God's throne, we are immersed in God's yes. A yes so powerful, it not only silences our no's, it brings forth a yes in us. Thanks be to God. And all God's people said, Amen. Yes. Okay, friends, would you stand with me now as we confess what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
Please be seated. The Lord be with you. Pray with me. O Heavenly Father and gracious God, we recognize to this world that this just seems like one hour out of our week. But on this Sabbath day, we pray and confess that this is our moment to rest and worship you. We thank you, O Lord, that we are on holy ground, not because of our presence, but by the presence of your Holy Spirit. We thank you, O God that as we gather for worship, we do so being raised to the highest heavens, knowing that there you are praised and glorified. And so we ask, O Lord, that we would recognize that your love is there for us, that your mercy blesses us, and that your grace sustains us. So give us courage and give us strength as we leave this holy place, knowing that your Son has called us by name into the world to be salt, to be light, to be a piece of you, For those who are broken, those who are lost. So we simply ask, O Lord, as we get on with our week, that when we see the stranger, we would see Jesus in him. But we especially ask, O Lord, that when the stranger sees us, they would see your Son, Jesus Christ. For it is in his holy name we pray the prayer he taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And now, my friends, let us continue our time of worship by giving our tithes and our offerings to the Lord.
Loving God, we give you thanks for all the gifts that you give us. We know that everything we have comes from you, and so we pray that you would receive what we give back, any money, any of our time, our energy, that you would redeem it, and that it would be used to participate in your mission in this world. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. My friends, we have been the church gathered, and thank goodness for that, because now we must be the church dispersed. Wherever we go, Christ goes. Whatever we say, Christ says. Whatever we do, Christ does. And so go with God's blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And all God's children say, Amen. Go in peace.